Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Iowa Arts Council Art Up. This is Veronica O'Hearn, Grants and Program Specialist with the Iowa Arts Council. And this is Joseph Pearson, Community Resources Specialist with the Iowa Arts Council. The Iowa Arts Council is a division of the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs, and we are your state arts agency. Today, we are pleased to present um, today's session of the Art Up, um, which are free professional development events for Iowa's artists, arts organizations, and communities. Today, we will host Ken Sturgis, CPA, who will present our Tax Prep for Artists webinar. But before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items. All of the lines are currently muted, and they will be for the duration of the presentation to reduce background noise, as this, as this webinar is being recorded. We will have a Q&A at the end of the webinar. If you would like to send questions to the presenter during the presentation, please feel free to use the chat feature on the left-hand side of the screen. You may also use the chat feature if you are experiencing technical difficulties. All right, that's the end of the housekeeping items. Thank you again for joining us today, and we'll go ahead and turn it over to Ken <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Ken, and uh, the informal pres uh, name of this presentation is How Not to Go to Jail, uh, Dealing with Accounting uh, and Taxes. Um, let me just give you a brief overview of who I am. Uh, I have, despite having a bachelor's degree in philosophy, I do have a master's in accountancy uh, from Iowa State. I am a certified uh, public accountant as well, <clears throat> and I currently work for a government agency that is more commonly known by a three-letter acronym. Um, in general right now, um, I do uh, small business audits. Uh, those are audits of businesses that make less than $250,000 a year. So um, in general, if, um, you know, if you're in this webinar, that probably includes um, you. Um, I'd like to do just a brief overview of what this presentation is going to cover. Um, the first thing, and I always like to kind of do this in a presentation, is um, why we should care. Why we should care about getting those numbers on our tax return correctly. Um, from there, I'm going to go to the biggest mistake that um, I have seen, or, or what my opinion is the biggest mistake that people make on their tax return. Uh, and then from there, we'll do some business tax law, focusing on really basic income and deductions. And then um, we're going to look at uh, what's the difference between uh, a hobby and a business and how that can affect your tax return. Um, but before we begin, there's some administrative stuff. And I have to tell you this, the views here are mine. They are well-researched. They're intelligent and informative. That being said, they are not necessarily the view of any government agency. Uh, any other CPA or tax accountant or the carpenter or plumber or sandwich artist from whom you get tax advice. These are my opinions and my alone, um, and you know, that's what it is. I'm not acting as a representative of anyone besides myself. Also, um, you know, one of the things that I have run into um, a lot, uh, especially in late night television, are there are these kind of advertisements or commercials that indicate that um, you know, secretly, somehow, if you just knew a little bit more of the tax code or something, you don't actually have to pay any taxes. And I'm here to tell you that that's, that's not true. Anytime you see, you know, you're, if you make money, you will eventually have to pay taxes on those. You know, the timing can maybe be a little bit different, but all of those people on late night TV uh, generally uh, are wrong. You will have to pay taxes. There are no super secrets about it. Um, you will also occasionally see an asterisk. Um, that means that, that, it, that I'm actually lying to you. Um, I have taken something that is really complicated and reduced it to something very simple. Um, and so it's so simple that it's actually just a little bit wrong. So if that's something that you're going to hang your hat on or want to know about, that's something you're going to have to research. Um, and also, this is a broad overview. Um, your Teachers uh, in grade school were actually all correct. You are all unique snowflakes. Um, this is not really, and you all have different tax situations. This is not attended as an advice for any single person. It's a very broad overview. And should you get into trouble, um, this is not something you could point back to uh, without doing any additional research uh, to say that, well, I followed this advice and I was being um, uh, incredibly reasonable. So this wouldn't avoid any negligence penalties under uh, code section 6662. 
Um, so <laughs> with all of that out of the way, let's begin. Um, so the first question is, um, why, do we, why do we care about getting the numbers in the tax return uh, correct? Well, the first thing, and this is a little bit more pragmatic, is the IRS actually does research on um, how much uh, taxes people should be paying and how much they actually pay. So, uh, you know, they're a little bit behind, uh, but the most recent numbers are from 2006. And there, is a, there was a $2.6 trillion that everybody owed. 2.2 of it was paid timely. And uh, through enforcement, through liens and audits, uh, there was an additional $65 billion that was brought in. So that leaves $385 billion uh, that should be collected that was not collected. Um, and that's, you know, that's 85%, so that's actually pretty good in comparison to a lot of other countries. So most people in the United States, um, you know, it's kind of positive, we're all pretty honest. Um, but, um, you know, as small business owners, the thing that should concern you the most is when the IRS looked at where are the areas of noncompliance, 235 billion of that, over half, is on individual tax returns. That's tax returns like the ones you file every year. And in fact, half of that, about uh, 122 billion, come from individual business returns. So that are individuals that, you know, file a Schedule C, uh, individual, individual business income, not just including expenses, just the income that forgets or people uh, mistake, mistakenly don't include. Um, now, again, I don't speak for any kind of official policy, but we can all kind of imagine um, if you were in charge and you made decisions and you looked at those numbers and go, well, geez, over half of our noncompliance is with individuals, um, maybe that's where you would focus your attention. I mean, again, I don't really know. Nobody ever tells me. But that's something that would, that would lend. Uh, it's a reasonable belief to have. And the other reason is, so that's, you know, pragmatically, you know, the IRS is probably going to be looking at small business. Uh, the next reason actually is when you do your tax return, you are actually um, and accidentally doing accounting. Um, and what that does is if you're consistent with your records, you are able to make better decisions about your business. So, you know, if you look at your Schedule C every year from year to year and you're consistent where you put the same expenses, those are actually income statements, just like a corporate, um, you know, like if you're investing in corporations or something, where they produce income statements for investors to look at, your Schedule C is your own tiny business. It's their income statement. And you can look from year to year to year to see if you're getting better, to see if the decisions that you made have paid off. Um, and that allows you uh, to learn about your business and make decisions about it, uh, which can be a very powerful tool, right? It figures out, you know, what you've done that, uh, you know, any decisions that you've made, does that bring in more money? It allows you to make a determination whether or not you know, if you're working 20 hours a week at your small business and at the end of the year you've lost money, that may not be worth your time. It's also something that allows you to determine, you know, any, inefficien any efficiencies within your business. If you know a certain product, um, my, uh, my spouse actually has her own small business and she actually looks at, and her records are so good that she can look at what products sell really good at what markets and what uh, products don't sell well at what markets, and she, she knows what product to bring to market whenever she goes to, uh, uh, I, can't, I don't even remember the names of them, like uh, Market Day, or uh, there's, the, there's a Lucky Star Market. Um, that's something you know, that she knows. And then of course, again, uh, it allows you uh, to you know, pay your taxes, okay? So this is why we care. We care because they're very pragmatic, pragmatically, uh, we want to make sure we're paying our taxes and we care because this, this work, this book work allows us to make better decisions about our small business. So, um, you know, one of the things that I've included in this presentation is um, different uh, tax and accounting related artwork throughout the ages. Uh, this is a um, Egyptian peasants that have been seized. So this is actual hieroglyphs, so someone went top off of a pyramid or something. And, um, you know, this is, uh, these are peasants that have been seized for accounting related crimes. Um, I know everyone kind of looks kind of placid uh, in the stone carvings, but they're clearly uh, the people who are holding them down holding sticks that have been used for some kind of enforcement. Um, anyway, uh, that's just, that's how accounting was represented back in uh, 2000 BC. Um, so what's the biggest mistake that people make 
um, when putting uh, together their tax return and preparing, uh, preparing to file it. And again, this is my personal opinion, but it's not keeping adequate records of what they're doing. You, uh, this is something that I have seen time and time again, is you just don't have the records to back up what's on your tax return. Um, and why is record keeping important? Uh, well, um, you know, the IRS has, in general, three years to look at your tax return. So, and that's from the date it's filed or the date it's due, whichever is later. Um, so, for example, um, you still need to be able to uh, substantiate deductions on your 2011 return. So, a really good way to determine whether or not your record keeping is really good is after this presentation, you go back to wherever, you know, the cardboard box in your basement where you keep all of your uh, tax returns and look at some of your expenses on your business in 2011, if you still have that, uh, if you had a business in 2011, and see if you can come up with how you got those numbers and whether or not you have evidence for those numbers. And um, if you can do that, you're probably doing pretty good. If you can't, maybe you need to look at how you keep your records. Um, the, other, the other issue is, in general, you have the burden of proof to substantiate any deduction that's on your return. Okay, this is not a, you know, whenever you, um, whenever you go through an audit, that's not necessarily a criminal action, that's, that's in civil court. And uh, in tax court, uh, the IRS is actually presumed correct. You have the burden of proof for your deduction. So it's a little bit different than what we kind of see uh, in cop dramas uh, around, <laughs> on, you know, late night TV. Um, so you need to have those records. So your goal, we just kind of talked about this, is you need to be able to understand what you did three years ago. Um, you need to have enough records to substantiate that number on your return. If you had $1,000 in supplies, how did you get to that $1,000 and where are your receipts for that? And then the other thing you want to do for record keeping is you want to keep your records safe. I don't understand why it is this way, uh, but in Iowa, we like to take our paper records and put it in a cardboard box and put it next to the drain in our basement. Um, Iowa, uh, surprisingly, has lots of flooding. And uh, so <laughs> those records can all get destroyed, and it makes it much more difficult to substantiate your ex uh, expenses after a flood. Um, I would recommend, um, personally, that uh, plastic tubs are really great. Uh, water can't always get through plastic, and I would uh, store your records on something uh, on an above ground level. Um, the other thing about record keeping, um, so while you're doing this, if you're gonna look at the way you keep records, I'd recommend that uh, record keeping should be cont uh, continuous. Um, you can, contemporaneous records, in general, have way more value so if you're there every, you know, however many records or however many expenses you have on a regular basis, you need to sit down every day, week, month, depending on what your level of expenses are, and you need to go through and do your books. Um, records that are done that way, that are done every month or every, you know, every once in a while, uh, have way more value in any kind of proceeding than records that are done on April 14th, the night before your tax return is due. And the ones that are done on April 14th have way more value than the ones that are done three years later, uh, the night before you go in for an audit. So, you know, that's a good way to make sure that contemporaneous uh, record keeping is a good way to make sure that, you know, you're logging everything down. And even if some of your records get destroyed, the fact that you kept those records contemporaneously lends a certain level of weight to them. So that's something you should just kind of get in the routine in doing it. Um, the other thing is you should never estimate any number on your tax return unless you have to. Um, so you shouldn't estimate. Uh, but if you have to, um, make sure you have a good basis for any estimation. If you're coming up with why uh, you're doing something, um, you know, write down a paragraph or two about, um, about, how you, about how you came to that estimation. Okay. Now we've talked about record keeping. We're going to move on to uh, taxes. Uh, this is uh, a painting called The Tax Collector. Uh, it was doing the Flemish Northern Renaissance. Um, of course, we're all familiar with that. And, um, you know, one of the things that I actually really like about this is this actually kind of looks like what my office looks like, with the papers just kind of strewn everywhere. The other thing is um, you can see that the individuals who are coming in to pay their taxes are doing so not with currency. Um, individuals, you can see the kind of farmer up there with the beard, has, uh, has a chicken that he's going to use to pay his taxes with, um, and the, the couple people behind him are using eggs and stuff. In, in areas that didn't have a strong currency, 
that's how a lot of people uh, before, you know, kind of standardization of currency, that's how people paid their taxes. It was a part of, the, part of your surplus uh, from your farm. Um, okay, so moving on to taxes, uh, the first thing we're going to start with, the most exciting part, is income. Um, and it may come to, um, it may come to surprise uh, everyone, but almost everything is income. And this is under Code Section 61, unless it's specifically exempted. Um, and the other phrase that's included in the Internal Revenue Code is including but not limited to, <laughs> okay? So pretty much everything is income, and, you know, it doesn't matter if you received a 1099 or not for it. It's still income. It doesn't matter if you received cash or if you received it as a check. It's still income. It doesn't matter if you received something that wasn't money. If you received a snowblower, that's still income. If you received tomatoes, if you traded an art piece, for uh, three or four pounds of tomatoes, that's still income and you need to assign a value to that and include that um, on your tax return, believe it or not. Um, if you don't have to live at a certain place, um, you know, for example, if you do um, graphic design work um, and for an apartment building and they just pay you in rent credits, that's still income. Um, and, you know, for example, and this is not necessarily business related, but if you have roommates that are living with you and you own the house, that's still income, okay? So, um, you know, income is much more inclusive. Uh, this is one of the things that I've run into a lot. A lot of people don't understand that income is incredibly inclusive. If you're engaging in something as a business, if you sell, um, you know, if you sell cups, if you sell, you know, like if you make your own clay cups and you sell them, um, you know, if people offer you tomatoes for that, you still need to include that in income. Um, uh, income is also um, included on your tax return is when it is received, not when it is billed in general. And I would recommend that you keep really good records of income. So you should update it on a regular basis. It's that, I mean, I think we can notice a theme here <laughs> is you should do record keeping on a regular basis. If you can be really good about separating your income and expenses, you should definitely uh, try to keep a separate business bank account, something where, you know, if you're really good about separating out those expenses, your personal expenses from your business expenses, that business bank account will ha definitely have a really good record of your income and expenses. And again, you're going to want to be able to, you're also, if you're at a fair, if you're at Lucky Star, and you want to, and you sell some stuff in cash, you should be able to reconcile your sales versus your money received. And you should, again, be able to tell what you did three years ago. Um, that's the kind of goal here. And here's the reason why you should keep really good records of income. If you mess up, and if you mess up on your total income on the return, that includes wages and all that stuff, the audit statute is no longer three years, it's six years. So that means that we would have to figure out what's on your 2008 return. So that could be hairy for almost anyone. So again, you want to make sure that all of your income is properly declared on the return. So here's a question. Gary and Hannah are vendors at Local Craft uh, Trade Art Show Emporium. Gary trades a beer bottle glass, so that's one where you take like a rogue bottle and, and break the top off and sand it down to make an excellent glass. Uh, normally, the glass is normally sold for 15 bucks and for one of Hannah's hipster pop art culture painting, uh, normally sold for $25. Who declares what as income, if any? Well, if you've been paying attention, uh, it's the consideration received. Gary received $25 worth of pop culture art, and he should include that as income. Hannah received uh, $15 worth of uh, beer bottles, and uh, she needs to include that in her income as well. One of the ways to get your spouse, uh, who run, my spouse runs a craft uh, business, uh, one of the ways to get your spouse to roll uh, her eyes at you is to inform her of this after she has made a trade of items, uh, <laughs> a trade of items at the craft show. Um, but it's true. If you receive something in trade, that's something that you need to include that value in your income. Okay, so now we've talked about income, we're gonna move on to expenses. Okay, so there's two different parts of expenses. There's code section 162, that's your basic stuff. These are not an official names, these are names that I've assigned them. And there's section 274, which is anything that could possibly ever cons be considered as fun. Um, so oh, really quickly, you can see that uh, back in the 1800s, uh, when people had their expenses, they actually had to write it out as opposed to using a computer. That to me is insane. Like I don't understand how 
people, uh, how people did that, but they did. Um, so here's your basic business expenses, code section 162. They, you know, that's if you've ever heard the phrase ordinary and necessary um, on TV or whatever, that's where this is from. Um, do other businesses like yours have these kind of expenses, right? If not, why? So there should be some very like obvious um, use, business use of these kind of expenses. It shouldn't be just kind of incidental. Um, and you need to take account of personal use. If you have a, uh, you know, device that, you know, you can stretch canvas or something and you use that for 8 out of 10 for business paintings, paintings that you try to sell, versus two that you make for personal, that you make for someone's birthday or something, you need to take account of that personal use. And you need to try at least to kind of, to kind of divvy that out. Um, and with these expenses, with these basic business expenses, you can sometimes estimate if you have a good reason. So if you do not take my advice and you put all of your records in a cardboard box next to a, uh, um, <clears throat> next to a drain, um, you know, and it floods and they all get destroyed, yes, you can estimate some of these expenses. But these are, again, these are very basic expenses. And remember, the burden of proof is on you. You're going to have to show how you came to this estimate, how this estimate is reasonable. So here's a really hard example, and one for there is no standard answer, everybody is different, you're all unique snowflake question, okay? Um, a really hard example is cell phone. A cell phone is pretty much indispensable for personal lives and for business lives, right? And you need to make, you, if you only have one cell phone and you don't just have a straight business cell phone, you need to make an allocation for your cell phone, okay? So you need to figure out how much of that is business and how much of that is personal. How much do you take sales calls? How much do you look at, um, you know, answer emails to someone who wants to buy some of your stuff? How much of that is engaging in business versus how much of that is personal? How much do you spend time, how much time do you spend playing Flappy Bird? What is your highest Flappy Bird score? And, I mean, if you can kind of think back how many games you had to play in order to get it, like how much time do you actually spend, you know, using on personal? I look at Reddit on my phone, on the bus, from my house to work every day. So uh, there's a huge chunk of my phone usage is personal. And then again, you're going to have to kind of prove it. You're going to have to show. Now, obviously, no one expects you to go through and look at each meg of data and where it went. But you're going to have to be able to at least put together a pretty cohesive story to say, hey, you know what? Um, you know, this is what I really use it for personally. This is what I use it for business. This is kind of what I think the percentage is after sitting down and thinking about it. Um, the other thing is, uh, statistically, it's just part of our human nature. People are really bad at estimating. Uh, it's just people always get it wrong. So my recommendation, again, this is not official policy of anyone um, besides me, is to be conservative when you look at that. Okay. Um, and I kind of snuck this in here. This is uh, just a kind of reiteration, and this is in the Internal Revenue Code. This is the opposite of Section 162, is Section 262. Um, it says there's no personal living or family expense. Personal family living or family expenses are never deductible. And for whatever reason, Congress has decided this is actually in the Internal Revenue Code. The first basic telephone, telephone line into your house is never deductible. It doesn't matter how much you use it for business or whatever. It's never, ever ever, ever deductible. Um, and of course, this was all done before cell phones, so, you know, uh, it doesn't really apply anymore. So. And Congress hasn't caught up, so. Um, so, we've talked about the really basic expenses, now we're going to move on to the fun stuff. So, Congress did it um, in, because there are things out there that, quote, lend themselves to personal use. These are things that uh, when Congress looked at the Internal Revenue Code, there's, they decided there's a high potential for abuse. Uh, and it's also anything that could be considered remotely fun um, in terms of taking expenses. So that's your mileage, that's your meals, your entertainment, and your travel. So along with the ordinary and necessary stuff, okay, so it has to be ordinary to your business and necessary to your business, there's a whole lot more record keeping requirements for travel, meals, and entertainment. You're going to have to list every element of your expenditure. So the date and time, the location, the business purpose, the amount, and if it's a bus substantial business conversation, if you're meeting someone to talk about business, if they want to buy your $25,000 painting and you said, well, maybe I'll take you out for a hamburger first, um, you, need to, you need to list who that is, who you met with. Now, the date and time, location, and amount, that's all taken care of by the receipt. So you're already, you know, three-fifths of the way there. 
you need to write down what the business purpose was. You know, I had a conversation with Derek Kensington about who wanted to buy my painting, right? You need to be able to write that down and substantiate that. And it especially looks really good if, you know, you had a conversation with Derek and then two days later, Derek bought your $25,000 painting. So that's something that you need to be able to show uh, when you're going to take a meal or entertainment expense, okay? Um, the other part of this is your mileage. Um, and this is where, you know, if you know someone who keeps a mileage log in their car or does it on their phone, this is why you have to keep a mileage log. So with the mileage log under this code section, um, you need to keep the beginning location, uh, you need the ending location, you need to also do the distance. Some people do odometer reading, some people use Google Maps, and then you also need to write down the business purpose. Why are you going on that trip? Some of that is really easy. Oh, I went to go buy supplies. Some of it may be more, uh, require a little bit more explanation. I went to go see Derek to talk about purchasing this, this piece of art. Um, you know, I actually think the code section here, the regulations are actually, so, uh, are actually pretty accessible. So if you Google 1.274-5T, I know it sounds like you're Googling nothing, um, but you will actually, I mean, you can actually, um, we'll get to the regulations and you can read through it if you're really interested um, about how this, how this all kind of works together and you want more than just a brief overview. I will admit they are incredibly boring, but they are, they are definitely accessible. Um, so that's, that's another kind of resource you can use um, when kind of figuring all this stuff out. Also, um, if you don't have records for expenses that are governed under this code section, um, there's no estimating whatsoever. It just, you can't. I'm sorry, this is, this is the way that the code section is written. Um, there's absolutely no estimating. If you don't have a log, if you don't have a mileage log, for example, and you don't go back and reconstruct it based on other evidence, then you don't get any additional expenses. There's a big, you know, an auditor would look at that and probably put a zero there, no matter how many miles you drove. Um, so that's just the really basic uh, tax rack up, ra ra eh, really basic tax, you know, income. Again, thing to remember, pretty much everything is income, especially if you're trading uh, different pieces of art and there's expenses you want to keep. And for your expenses, um, and I know that this is a general theme that you guys are seeing through all of this, keep really good organized records. Expenses should have a strong relation to your business and you want to keep logs, uh, you know, if you ever have a meal or if you have mileage, you want to keep those logs on a regular basis. Okay, so that covers our basic tax law. Um, now we're going to look at not-for-profit and uh, hobby loss rules. And this is, a, this is a famous painting called The Calling of St. Matthew, uh, a famous tax collector. And uh, you can see here, uh, this is just an insert of the painting. Um, you see the beam of light coming down um, and hitting St. Matthew. Matthew is generally the, uh, the bearded guy. Um, and what I kind of like about it is as he's being called uh, to service, he kind of points the finger at himself and he really looks like with his eyes is saying, uh, uh, who, m me? So I kind, of, I kind of appreciate that sentiment. <laughs> but we're going to talk about, first of all, why we should care about hobby or businesses, right? If you're a business, um, why, why do you care about the designation of whether or not you're a hobby, whether or not you're a business, okay? If you're a business um, and you have more expenses than income, you know, you have $5,000 of income, you have $10,000 of business, uh, $10,000 of expenses, you can take that $5,000 loss and apply it to other income you may have. So for example, your wages or whatever. Um, if you're a hobby, you can't do that. And there's a whole host of other really annoying issues. But in general, that's the big one is you can't do that if you're a hobby. So the really good question is, how do I know whether or not I'm a biz uh, hobby or a business? Well, there's nine factors um, that are in code section 183. Um, and everyone all over the place says that these nine factors are not all inclusive, but I've also never seen anyone else use anything else besides those nine factors. It's just the way it is. So these nine factors, which we'll go over here in just a second. Um, the really, this is like the first test, okay? Before getting into all this kind of looking at nine factors and putting your business in all these nine factors, there's a really easy way to determine whether or not you're a business. The presumption is if you make money three out of five years, uh, there's a presumption that basically says you're a business. So if you've made uh, money uh, <laughs> three out of five years, you can probably, I don't know, hang up on the conference right now. You're done. You're a business. Uh, for some reason, and I don't know why this is, I guess there's a lot of congressmen that own 
the uh, congressmen that own horses. Uh, for horse breeding, um, it's only two out of every seven years. It's just the way it is. It's, I mean, it's kind of just attached right at the end of the code. Um, Okay, so let's say maybe we're not doing so good. Maybe we don't have this presumption thing. Maybe we only had income two out of five years, and we had a lot, lot more losses than we did income. Well, if that's the case, then you need to go through these nine factors, and we'll kind of go through them here. I know this is kind of boring, but this is something that you should be aware of when you're engaging in your business. The first factor, and I think this is the most important factor, and this kind of goes along with what I've said all throughout for the last 30 minutes, is how you engage in your activity, right? Do you keep good records? Do you operate like a business? So do you go through and you look at your income and you say, hey, wait a second, I know that these items are selling better than these other ones, right? I know that these pieces of jewelry that I've made just way sell faster. Then you need to, and you know, if you keep those good records to make those determinations and then you make those decisions throughout the year, that looks a whole lot more like a business. If you kind of shove everything in a shoebox and don't make any decisions about your business and just kind, of, just kind of do it, that looks a little bit more like a hobby. Um, the next, so that's something that you need to really be aware of, you know, if you have any losses over years, how you're actually conducting yourself. Um, the other thing is, uh, the next kind of thing, and this is also important, is the expertise. Art is, are the expertise of the taxpayer and their advisors. Um, I have seen people go through art school. Art is not something you just kind of, in general, art is not something you just kind of pick up one day and do it. There is a lot of work, a lot of craft, a lot of training that goes in, whether it's a painting, a ceramics, or even, um, you know, my spouse does feathered hair clips, hair clips. There's a lot of training that goes into that, and there's a lot of work that goes into developing those skills. So the first question is, do you know what you're doing? Uh, if you don't know what you're doing, it looks a little bit more like a hobby. Um, if you do know what you're doing, it looks more like a business. And if you've found deficiencies in your knowledge and your skills, how have you remedied that? Have you gone back to school? Have you gone to someone, if you want to get into painting, have you gone into someone who's a good painter and studied under them? That's how you look more like a business as opposed to a hobby. The third is effort and time. Um, you know, do you spend a lot of time doing it? Are you painting eight hours a day every day? Um, or do you only kind of maybe do it three times a year? And then the amount of time that you do it, is it productive work time? Are you, no matter, even if you have a cold, are you in front of that canvas painting every day? Or are you kind of just hanging out with your art buddies and drinking wine every Friday night? Those are things um, that, you know, if you're out in front of that canvas every day, it looks a little bit more like a business. Those are things that are very important. Um, and then the next, the next kind of grouping is about all kind of, you know, income base. So maybe you're not making money now, but maybe some of your assets have increased. So maybe you've made a painting, it's been hung in, you know, the, Metropoli the, the Metropolitan uh, Museum in New York. That's going to increase the value of that painting. So maybe your paintings have increased in value and you just haven't sold them yet. So, you know, if you're taking a $2,000 loss every year and all of a sudden you have this $25,000 painting you can sell, it looks a little bit more like a business. It looks like in the future you're going to make a whole lot more money. Um, the other thing is, if you've had is your success in other activities, if you've had 47 other failed ventures, it really starts looking like you're just kind of doing hobbies as opposed to actually running a business. Um, and this is the kind of, these kind of lump together, but uh, number six is the history of income and losses. You know, do you have losses every ten, uh, for, the next, for the last 10 years, or have you had some income in the past and maybe you just had a rough, and what's the reason for that income and losses? Maybe you've had a rough sales season, maybe the kind of paintings you do have fallen out of favor. Um, all of that isn't considered. And that also is considered is, what's the occasional profit that you make? So maybe, yeah, maybe you have losses nine out of 10 years, but that 10th year, you make a million dollars when you sell your world famous painting, and that's a cycle you've been able to repeat every 30 years, well, or every, every 10 years. Um, you know, then that really kind of looks like a business because, you know, overall, uh, even though you're uh, not making money out of nine years, overall, you're probably making some money. Um, the other, the last two things is, uh, are, what is, what is the taxpayer's financial status? So, you know, are you engaging in this hobby? Do you have losses every year? And are you offsetting other income? So do you have $100,000 in wages, for example, that, um, that you're offsetting 
through your business? Or is this business the only thing that you have? Is this running this business the only way for you to get money? If it's the only way for you to get money, it looks a little bit more like a business. If you're, offset, uh, you know, if you're offsetting your uh, million dollar salary or something, then it maybe doesn't quite look like such a business. And then everyone, this is a little contentious, but the issue of personal pleasure, you know, do you really enjoy what you do? It's not a controlling issue, but it's important. Um, so obviously you can enjoy what you want to do and still have a business. But if, again, combined with other factors, if you have a loss for year after year after year, um, in general, that's something that's really considered and makes it look more like a hobby. Um, it's kind of assumed that if you work all year and work really hard, that you're going to want to see something from that. Um, you know, imagine if you showed up to work every day and at the end of the year they go, hmm, you know, things have been tough. Can you, can you, uh, I know we, and I know we haven't paid you um, all year, but, and could you, uh, could you toss us $10,000? <laughs> uh, most people would quit that job right away. And, you know, if that's, if that's the kind of thing that's happening on your tax return, why is that happening? Is it because you're really engaging in business and because maybe things haven't worked out and you're trying different things and you kept really good records or is it because you just maybe kind of enjoy it? You enjoy you know, the, the activity in and above itself. Okay. Um, uh, Joseph actually sent me this court case because um, he wanted, because it made kind of waves in the art community um, and it's Criley versus Commissioner and this came out uh, last year. Um, and this is one such case. So um, uh, there's 50 pages of <laughs> uh, testimony and expert witness testimony and stuff, but it was turned out um, Criley was a person who was a professional artist, uh, and she'd never really made any money, and she had substantial losses every year. Okay? Um, and so the IRS came in and said, hey, wait, this is a hobby. Um, the court case, uh, all 50 pages of it, um, you know, goes through those nine factors. Uh, you know, Criley actually was a pretty successful artist on a professional level. Um, you know, she has actually had her paintings uh, hung in the Met. She kept really good records of her income, and she actually had a record system where she noted which paintings had been hung where and the value that that increased the painting, right? So it really looked like even though she didn't make any money, she was kind of running a business and she had some kind of expectation of profit from her work. And she really kind of engaged to have her paintings placed in those uh, art galleries. Um, the IRS said it was a hobby anyway. Um, the court came in um, and after listening to pages and pages and pages of expert testimony, uh, testimony uh, the court actually agreed with the taxpayer and the IRS lost, which is, which is pretty significant because the IRS wins 98, 99% of its cases. So, um, and it was reported in the New York Times um, as a victory for taxpayers, right? So Kylie did really well. Um, but there's actually a twist that nobody, that I, as far as I knew, ever actually reported on it. So this is actually in the court case, um, and you should recognize what's going on here um, as I go, because I'm going to... Um, so even though she won the court case, there were still problems with her return. And this is, I'm only going to read the bolded parts, but, uh, you know, a significant number of Criley's deductions that she claimed uh, were not ordinary and necessary business expenses, but they were actually personal living or family expenses. The latter expenses appeared to have been cable and television, uh, uh, sorry, telephone and cable, uh, television bills, gratuities to Dorman and her apartment building, uh, taxi cabs to the opera, meals with friends, and international travel to gain inspiration from paintings in European museums. If you learn nothing from this, you cannot write off your European vacation ever. Um, it is clear to the court that the economic losses she actually sustained in her art business were substantially smaller than the tax losses reported on her Schedule Cs. So, you know, even though it was reported as a victory here, we, you know, the court has explained and actually heard the next part of the court case is docketed to, uh, to go over those expenses. Criley is still going to owe the man some money at the end of all this because she didn't, she didn't have the benefit of listening to this uh, conference going over what's a business expense, personal living, record keeping, all that kind of stuff. So um, that's something to keep in mind that even though there's this kind of idea of whether or not I'm a hobby or business, the really important stuff is keeping your records, making sure your expenses relate directly to your business, and uh, don't ever write off your European vacation, ever. Um, 
So here's, uh, here's, another, here's a couple of resources. If you're interested in a 54-page, 54, yeah. Uh, if you're interested in a 50-page tax court case to read um, and uh, you just don't have anything to do on a Friday night, uh, here's the link to it. I actually thought it was really interesting, if long. And um, here's the other thing is that IRS actually releases audit technique guides. That's what they give to their examiners when they look at activities not engaged in for profit, for example. And they release those, and it could be a resource. They release those to the public. It's something that you can just go on to the irs.gov and pick up. And if you're really worried about your activity being a, uh, a business versus a hobby, and if this is something that really concerns you, you know, you can get that um, you can get that guide and you can review it. It's, it's actually a really well put together guide. There's lots of questions that are there um, for the examiner to ask you. Uh, so it's something you can be prepared for and it's something that you can actually look at the questions yourself and meditate on them and go, geez, do I sound like a business or not? And you can make the correct determination before, um, you know, or if, you know, if you ever get audited or anything like that. You can kind of figure that out before you file your tax return. All right, and that covers the hobby versus business stuff. And thank you for hanging on for the entire presentation. Um, I'm ready for any questions if you guys have any. If you guys do have questions, please feel free to use the chat box on the left-hand side of the screen. We will hang on the line here for just a minute or two to make sure we get everyone covered. We did have one question Ken come across during the presentation, and that was, do you know of any tools or products that facilitate mileage tracking, or do you find pen and paper works best? Um, <laughs> the, the best world, um, like I, I, I personally can't recommend any products um, because I don't ever have to, on my personal end, I don't ever have to track any mileage. I, I think the, the people kind of get wrapped up in using a product like, oh, if I just have this thing um, on my iPhone, then everything's going to be fine. You know, to me, the real, the real cross is, you know, the real thing that you have to do, the real apex is to just make sure you write it down. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of mileage logs that are done pen and paper and they're fine. Uh, you got to make sure your handwriting's mostly okay. Um, you know, my spouse actually goes the extra mile uh, and she, um, she has, she actually sits down once a week and puts it in a spreadsheet. Uh, and she kind of reviews what she did. She looks at her calendar. That's another way to have an idea of what you did. She looks at her calendar that week, puts it in, and just, you know, every Friday night when we should be out partying, uh, that's what she does. And she puts together her books and records. Um, beyond that, I would recommend just making sure you have a log uh, like in the car, like a notebook, so you can write it down, and then um, you know try to get it into a computer later, so that you know three years from now you can kind of read it. Okay, great, thanks. It looks like we have a few questions that just rolled in here, so we'll just take them as they came in. The first is from Jennifer. If I use a percentage of my living space as a working studio, am I able to write off that portion of my rent? Um, yeah, actually, uh, this, this changed to be a whole lot easier, uh, which I'm really excited about. Um, so yes, so the rules for having a studio or uh, an office space is um, they have to be used. It doesn't have to be a whole room, okay? So there was already a court case about that 30 years ago. But um, it has to be used ex regularly and exclusively for business, okay? So the space that you designate as your studio, that's got to have all of your, you know, that's got to have only business stuff there. You have to almost kind of think of it as an office that you would go to to do your work. So don't include, you know, the area that has, um, you know, maybe some dog kennels. Uh, don't include the area that has your, you know, your kitchen <laughs> or something. You need to make sure that it's exclusively used for business. Uh, and that's, that's a really strong use of the word exclusively. That's in the Internal Revenue Code. Um, and what, what you can do is when you're preparing your tax return, the instructions um, for the Schedule C, I think, will have this. If not, there's instructions for um, that on, on irs.gov. But what you'll do is you will take um, – you have two options. One is the easy way is to take the amount of square foot that you use, um, and you get so many dollars per square foot, whatever the IRS comes up with. I think it's five right now, um, but I, I'm not exactly sure. Um, and then, yeah, so you would write that percentage off. So 
Um, you know, if you had 30 square feet, you'd multiply that by the appropriate rate, and that's the deduction you would get. Uh, on the, uh, you can do the complicated way as well, which you would write down all the expenses used for maintaining your apartment, um, the, all your rent, your utilities, um, that kind of stuff, and then you would figure out what the ratio is of your business space to not business space. Remember, it has to be exclusive. And uh, then you would uh, take a ratio of that, of all those expenses. Uh, my recommendation, because I'm a, I'm a simple person, is I would take this standard rate because, because then you don't have to keep receipts of all the rent you paid, all the utilities you paid, or whatever. Okay, great, thanks. All right, next question. If an artist receives a grant, how should they treat it? Is it simply considered income? Um, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, um, in general, okay, so um, I, I, in general, what I would say is if you're doing work in a, in a capacity as your business, right, so you're going through, you know, your job is to paint paintings and then you get paid money to paint those paintings, that's taxable income to me and I think you should include that on your return. Um, and in general, that rule, you know, as we saw with Code Section 61, unless there's some specific exclusion for the certain type of grant that you've received, which in general I doubt, it's going to be income. Um, you know, if you receive some super special grant, um, you know, or something maybe, but in general it's, it's taxable income. You're getting paid to do work uh, and you have to include it in your tax return like everybody else. Okay, great. We do get that question a lot, so thanks. Um, next up is, if I travel out of state to take a workshop, is any part of that deductible? Yeah, um, assuming the workshop, uh, okay, so the underlying assumption here is, you know, a very simple scenario, you're going to go to this workshop, this workshop is related to your business, it's developing and improving, you know, one of your technical skills or something. Um, yeah, so if you travel out of state, um, you know, if you travel outside the general commuting area, you could take the mileage, for example. If it's a multiple day workshop, let's say it's a th uh, three day workshop, you could take the amounts that you spend on a hotel um, there if you stay there or if you do Airbnb or whatever. Um, and you could also take uh, your meal and entertainment expenses. Um, now they'll always be reduced by 50% on the tax return, but um, you would be able to take your meal expenses for travel as well. If you don't want to keep receipts for all of your uh, meal and entertainment expenses, um, depending on the location, you can take the per diem rate for the meals and incidentals only. Uh, in general, it's $42, but it's a little bit higher in places like Minneapolis or New York. Um, and you would take that for the number of days that you're gone. Um, and so that's kind of a way you can do it. But yes, if you're traveling for business and you're doing it for your personal business, um, it, or if you're doing it for your business that you engage in on your, um, uh, on your Schedule C, that's something you can take as a deduction. Okay, um, next up. Um, are credit card statements enough, or do we need to have the original receipt for expenses? Um, it depends, uh, which is always the uh, answer you're going to get. Um, in general, it's best to have the receipt because you need to be able to show what you purchased. Sometimes, you know, some credit card statements are really good, um, you know, especially if you buy airline tickets or hotels. It'll say, you stayed at this hotel for these dates. Um, that's to, to me, and this is my own personal opinion, that's good enough. Um, if you've got $30 that you spent at Walmart, a credit card statement's not going to cover it. You know, you're going to need to keep that receipt to show that you bought art supplies or that you weren't, you know, buying, you know, all the fun stuff like, you know, liquor and candy bars and stuff. Um, that's what you've got to be. Um, so that's, you know, again, if it's something that tells, if it's a place like a big box store, you're going to need to keep those receipts. If it's something really technical, uh, from a technical store, if it's, you know, I run into, um, if there's places that only sell one type of item, that's a little bit better. Um, when all that information from hotels and airline tickets or whatever, when that's all on your credit card, that, then your credit cards are good enough. Okay. Um, next up is sometimes I receive donations um, from people and I repurpose materials to make my products. How do I document the income value of these donations? Okay, um, so there's, there's two questions there. Um, it's, yeah, the income value, okay, how you determine the income value of, of a donation is 
what what it would be um, if you know kind of what's the fair market value of the item, right? So I would take a list of um, you know all the stuff that you receive all the year throughout the year that you can use as um, that you receive. So you know if you receive a TV that still works. You know, what's the fair market value of that TV? Is it a, one of those old cathode ray tube TVs or is it a um, LCD? So again, once, uh, and here's the other thing though, is once you, if you declare it as income, like if someone gives it to you or trades you for product or something like that and you declare it as income, um, then you would use that same figure as a deduction when you use it as, in, as your business. Now, if you just keep it, like if someone trades you a TV and you keep it and you watch it for, you know, watching The Daily Show or whatever, that's not something you can take a business expense for. But if you repurpose that TV as an art project and then sell that, sell that, uh, sell that TV, then that's something you would be able to take a deduction for. Okay, next question. Um, if you foresee that you are going to be taking losses for several years into the future before you start netting profits, at what point do you think you can start calling it a business? Two years uh, before income for two out of the five. I mean, mm -hmm. if you have really good documentation and you have really good reason why um, your business is the way it is, for some, you know, um, I, I know this isn't an art example, but the idea behind the horse thing, for example, is you actually have to raise horses before you can sell them. So if you're doing a horse breeder thing, that takes time. Um, you know, if there's certain things that you have this expectation of, uh, and it sounds like you've done some research, so you, this, is, this is good that you've done that. Um, I think that you want to start being engaged in that business, um, either once you open the doors, um, once you've kind of moved, and this is something you're just going to have to make that call yourself, but once you move from this kind of investigor, inve investigatory phrase to maybe selling product or having product that's available for sale, that's when your business starts. Um, I would make sure you document, you know, have a business plan. Um, and maybe that's just good for yourself regardless of the tax purposes for that. So you can say, hey, um, I've done my research. I know it's going to take a little bit longer. To, to get this business going, but this is what I anticipate uh, for my expenses and eventual income into the future. And I think that's a very powerful, you know, that, that's what a business would do when they're opening up a new venture. And I think that's a very powerful thing to help you if anyone ever questions whether or not um, it's just a business or a hobby. Because a lot of people don't go through the, uh, if it's going to be a hobby, a lot of people don't go through putting together a business plan for their hobby. They just go ahead and do it. Okay, thanks. Um, the next one is specific to performing artists, um, and this question is asking whether or not things like clothing for performances or um, having headshots or hair and makeup, things like that, that are specific to performing artists can be deducted. Huh. Um, right, so, um, like, a, yeah, I mean, so one thing you have to look at is the difference between, you know, what do you do as a is what you are what you are doing is when you engage in a business versus what you do personal. So in general, um, especially um, for people who are just you know mundane office worker people, makeup and stuff is never deductible. Even though it's Joseph's now frowning at me, um, <laughs> but uh, you know makeup and good clothing, none of that stuff is ever deductible. If you're you know even if you work for uh, I think there was a court case with someone who worked for Yves Saint Laurent. Uh, and they had to have that kind of stuff, and they, none of that stuff was deductible. Um, but when you're a performance artist, so I Im imagine it immediately came to mind was a clown, um, <laughs> and you have like the big floppy shoes and the big, uh, you know, uh, weirdo suit that you wear and the, the white makeup that you would put on. Yeah, that's a, those are all business expenses. Uh, things like stage makeup, that's a business expense. If that's what you do when you engage in business and people pay money or someone pays you money to go put on this performance, yeah, a lot of that stuff, a lot of costuming and stuff, that stuff is deductible. Okay, great. Um, we have about two more. The first relates to your answer um, about having a business plan. And this question is, how do you deal with having a business um, and then going back to school for a couple of years while you're still working, but the business has been scaled back to hobby status because you are now enrolled in school? Um. 
I'm not. Yeah, yeah. So the hobby status is really just kind of how it's treated on the tax return. Um, so you know that's a kind of a technical thing, and um, I actually know the person who asked that question, and so maybe we can talk about that later. Um, <laughs> um, that's that's actually a really technical and long-winded answer. So. Um, uh, we'll, we'll email, I promise, and we'll maybe meet about it and talk about it. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, and then finally, for the sake of the whole group, do you have any specific recommendations about record keeping software, or online resources, or professionals that people who are trying to get their records in order should look into? <laughs> um, I, again, I can't make any specific recommendations. Um, I have, to, to, to help all the people out there, though, I have seen people do um, I've, once, I've seen people do really good with paper records where they write everything down and total it up. To me, it's very impressive, and they, that's just how they do. To me, it's about, and I've seen people who do really good with spreadsheets. I've seen people do really good with accounting software. To me, it's about being consistent. It's about going through and figuring things out and just making sure that you personally can go back and figure it out um, three years after the case. Um, and however you do that, you know, it's kind of it's kind of left up to however um, it's kind of left up to however however you think it's best to do that. My own spouse, for example, she uses spreadsheets, and she basically at the end of the year she has her lead sheet. These are all of my supplies expenses. She takes that lead sheet, takes all the receipts in date order, uh, puts that behind the lead sheet, staples it, puts it into a plastic tub, and we don't ever have to look at it ever again. Okay, great. Well, for those of you who still have burning questions, um, we will be following up um, this webinar with uh, a recording of the presentation as well as the slides. So you are welcome to email us any additional questions and we will um, try to get those answered for you. But um, I guess we are, we are done today, so we just want to thank Ken Sturgis again for being with us for this hour and for the Tax Prep for Artists webinar. So thank you, Ken. Yeah, it was really fun. And thanks to everyone for joining us.